Hello and welcome back. We are going to continue reading Coraline by Neil Gaiman. Today we're reading chapter five. What we've read so far is Coraline has recently met the other mother, the other father, and many of the other people that happened to be in this world after she went through the door. Um, she, after exploring and spending a good chunk of the day there, has now returned home, uh, back to her own home, and refused uh, the other mother in allowing her to uh, sew buttons on her eyes as they requested for her to stay. So chapter five, we'll see where our story continues. Uh, our picture is a rat with a key. To start our story, our chapter today. Chapter five. Coraline locked the door of the drawing room with a cold black key. She went back into the kitchen and climbed onto the chair. She tried to put the bunch of keys back on top of the door frame again. She tried four or five times before she was forced to accept that she just wasn't big enough. And she put them down on the counter next to the door. Her mother still hadn't returned from her shopping expedition. Coraline went to the freezer and took out the spare loaf of frozen bread in the bottom compartment. She made herself some toast with jam and peanut butter. She drank a glass of water. She waited for her parents to come back. When it began to get dark, Coraline microwaved herself a frozen pizza. Then Coraline watched television. She wondered why all the grown-ups gave themselves all the good programs with all the shouting and running around in. After a while, she started yawning. Then she undressed, brushed her teeth, and put herself to bed. In the morning, she went to her parents' room, but their bed hadn't been slept in, and they weren't around. She ate canned spaghetti for breakfast. For lunch, she had a block of cho cooking chocolate and an apple. The apple was yellow and slightly shriveled but it tasted sweet and good. She, for tea, she went down to see Mrs. Spink and Forcible. She had three digested biscuits, a glass of limeade, and a cup of weak tea. The limeade was very interesting. It didn't taste like anything like limes. It tasted bright green and vaguely chemical. Coraline liked it enormously. She wished they had had it at home. How are your dear mother and father? Asked Miss Spink. Missing, said Coraline. I haven't seen either of them since yesterday. I'm on my own. I think I've probably become a single child family. Tell your mother that we found the Glasgow Empire press clippings we were telling her about. She seemed very interested when Miriam mentioned them to her. She's vanished under mysterious circumstances, said Coraline, and I believe my father has as well. I'm afraid we'll be out all day tomorrow, Caroline. Lovey, said Miss Forcible. We'll be staying over with April's niece in Royal Tunbridge Wells. They showed Coraline a photographic album, which put with Photographs of Miss Spink's niece in it, and then Coraline went home. She opened her money box and walked down the supermarket. She bought two bar large bottles of limeade, a chocolate cake, and a new bag of apples, and went back home and ate them for dinner. She cleaned her teeth and went into her father's office. She woke up his computer and wrote a story. Coraline's story. There was a girl. Her name was Apple. She used to dance a lot. She danced and danced until her feet turned into sausages. The end. She printed out the story and turned off the computer. Then she drew a picture of the little girl dancing underneath the words on the paper. She ran herself a bath with too much bubble bath in it, and the bubbles ran over the side and went all over the floor. She dried herself in the floor as best she could and went to bed. Coraline woke up in the night. She went into her parents' bedroom, but the bed was made and empty. The glowing green numbers on the digital clock glowed 3.12 a.m. All alone in the middle of the night, Coraline began to cry. There was no other sound in the empty flat. She climbed into her parents' bed, and after a while, she went to sleep. Coraline was woken by cold paws batting her face. She opened her eyes. Big green eyes stared back at her. It was the cat. Hello, said Coraline. How did you get in? The cat didn't say anything. Coraline got out of bed. She was wearing a long t-shirt and pajama bottoms. Have you come to tell me something? The cat yawned, which made its eyes flash green. Do you know where mommy and daddy are? The cat blinked at her slowly. Is that a yes? The cat blinked again. Coraline decided that that was indeed a yes. Will you take me to them? The cat stared at her. Then it walked out into the hall and she followed it. It walked the length of the corridor and stopped down at the very end where the full, full length mirror hung. The mirror had been a long time before the inside of a wardrobe door. It had been hanging there on the wall when they moved in. And although Coraline's mother had spoken to Caves and replacing it with something newer, she never had. Coraline turned on the light in the hall. The mirror showed the corridor behind her that was only to be expected, but reflected in the mirror were her parents. They stood awkwardly in reflection of the hall. They seemed sad and alone. As Coraline watched, they waved to her slowly with limp hands. Coraline's father had his arm around her mother. 
In the mirror, Coraline's mother and father stared at her. Her father opened his mouth and said something, but she couldn't hear nothing at all. Her mother breathed on it inside of the glass, mirror, the gl mirror glass, and quickly before the fog faded, she wrote, help us. I'll show you where she wrote. It looks backwards because on the mirror, uh, we're seeing the opposite way with the tip of her forefinger. The fog on the inside of the mirror faded and so did her parents. And now the mirror reflected only the corridor and Coraline and the cat. Where are they? Coraline asked the cat. The cat made no reply, but Coraline could imagine its voice dry as a dead fly on a windowsill in winter saying, well, where do you think they are? They aren't going to come back, are they? Said Coraline, not on their own steam. The cat blinked at her. Coraline took it as a yes. Right, said Coraline. Then I suppose there's only one thing left to do. She walked into her father's study. She sat down at his desk. Then she picked up the telephone and she opened the phone book and telephoned the local police station. Police, said a gruff male voice. Hello, said Coraline. She said, my name is Coraline Jones. You're a bit after your bedtime, aren't you, young lady? Said the policeman. Possibly, said Coraline, who was not going to be diverted, but I'm ringing to report a crime. And what sort of crime might that be? Kidnapping. Grown-up napping, really. My parents have been stolen away into a world on the other side of the mirror in our hall. How do you know who stole them? Asked the police officer. Coraline could hear the smile in his voice and the tried extra hard to sound like an adult might sound to make him take her seriously. I think my other mother has them both in her clutches. She may want to keep them and sew their eyes with black buttons, or she may simply have them in order to lure me back into the reach of her fingers. I'm not sure. Ah, the nefarious clutches of her fiendish fingers, is it, he said. Hmm, you know why I suggest, Miss Jones? No, said Coraline, what? You ask your mother to make you a big old mug of hot chocolate, and they give you a great big old hug. There's nothing like hot chocolate and a hug for making the nightmares go away. And if she starts to tell you off for waking her up at this time of night, why, you tell her that that's what the policeman said. He had a deep, reassuring voice. Coraline was not reassured. When I see her, said Coraline, I shall tell her that. And she put down the telephone. The black cat who sat on the floor grooming his fur through the entire conversation now stood up and led the way into the hall. Coraline went back into the bedroom and put on her blue dressing gown and her slippers. She looked under the sink for a flashlight and found one. But the batteries had long since run down and it barely glowed with the faintest straw colored light. She put it down again and found a box of in case of emergency white wax candles and thrust one into a candlestick. She put an apple into each pocket. She picked up the ring and keys and took the old black key off the ring. She walked into the drawing room and looked at the door. She had the feeling that the door was looking at her, which she knew was silly and knew on a deeper level was somehow true. She went back into her bedroom and rummaged in the pocket of her jeans. She found the stone with a hole in it and put it in her dressing gown pocket. She lit the candle wick with a match and watched it sputter and light. Then she picked up the black key. It was cold in her hand. She put it in the keyhole in the door, but did not turn the key. When I was a little girl, said Coraline to the cat, when we lived in our old house a long, long time ago, my dad took me for a walk on the west wasteland between our house and the shops. It wasn't the best place to go for a walk, really. There were all these things that people had thrown away back there. Old cookers and broken dishes and dolls with no arms and no legs and empty cans and broken bottles. Mom and dad made me promise not to go exploring back there because there were too many sharp things and tetanus and such. But I kept telling them I wanted to explore it. So one day my dad put on his big brown boots and his gloves and put, on my, put my boots on me and my jeans and my sweat and sweater and we went for a walk. We must have walked for about 10 minutes. We went down this hill to the bottom of the gully where a stream was. When my dad suddenly said to me, Coraline, run away, up the hill, now. He said it in a tight sort of way, urgently, so I did. I ran all the way up the hill. Something hurt me on my back of my arm as I ran, but I kept running. As I got to the top of the hill, I heard somebody thundering up the hill behind me. It was my dad charging like a rhino. When he reached me, he picked me up in his arms and swept me over the edge of the hill. And then we stopped and puffed and we panted. We looked back down the gully. The air was alive with yellow wasps. We must have stepped on a wasp's nest in a rotten branch as we walked. And while I was running up the hill, my dad stayed and got stung to give me some time to run away. His glasses had fallen off when he ran. I only had the one sting in the back of my arm. He had 39 stings all over him. We counted later in the bath. The black cat began to wash its face and whiskers in a manner that indicated increasing impatience. Coraline reached down and stroked the back of its head and neck, 
The cat stood up, walked several paces until it was out of her reach, then it sat down and looked up at her again. So, said Coraline, later that afternoon, my dad went back again to the wasteland to get his glasses back. He said if he left it another day, he wouldn't be able to remember where they had fallen. And soon he got home wearing his glasses. He said that he wasn't scared when he was standing there and the wasps were stinging him and hurting him. And he was watching me run away because he knew he had to give me enough time to run or the wasps would come after both of us. Coraline turned the key in the door. It turned with a loud clunk. The door swung open. And there, there was no brick wall on the other side of the door, only darkness and cold wind blew through the passageway. Coraline made no move to walk through the door. And he said that he wasn't brave of him doing that, just standing there and being stung, said Coraline to the cat. It wasn't brave because he wasn't scared. It was the only thing he could do. But going back again to get his glasses when he knew the wasps were there, when he really was, when he was really scared, that was brave. She took her first step down the dark corridor. She could smell dust and damp and mustiness. The cat pied along beside her. And why was that? asked the cat, although it sounded barely interested. Because, she said, when you're scared, you, but you still do it anyway, that's brave. The candle cast huge, strange, flickering shadows along the wall. She heard something moving in the darkness beside her to one side of her. She could not, could not tell. It seemed as, as if it were keeping pace with her, whatever it was. And that's why you're going back to her world then, said the cat, because your father once saved you from wasps. Don't be silly, said Coraline. I'm going back for them because they are my parents. And if they noticed I was gone, I'm sure they would do the same for me. You know you're talking again. How fortunate I am, said the cat. I, in having a travel companion of such wisdom and intelligence. His tone seemed remained sarcastic, but his fur was bristling and the brush of the tail stuck up in the air. Coraline was going to say something like, sorry, or wasn't it a lot shorter walk last time? But the candle went out as suddenly as if it had been snuffed out by someone's hand. There was a scrabbling and a pattering, and Coraline could feel her heart pounding against her ribs. She put out one hand and felt something wispy, like a spider web's brush, her hands and face. The end of the corridor, the electric light went on, blinding after the darkness. A woman stood silhouetted by a light, a little head of Coraline. Coraline, darling, she called. Mom, said Coraline. She ran forward eager and relieved. Darling, said the woman, why did you ever run away from me? Coraline was too close to stop, and she felt the other mother's cold arms enfold her. She stood there rigid and trembling as the other mother held her tightly. Where are my parents? Coraline asked. We're here, said her other mother in a voice so close to her real mother's that Coraline could scarcely tell them apart. We're here. We're ready to love you and play with you and feed you and make your life interesting. Coraline pulled back and the other mother let go with reluctance. The other father, who had been sitting on a chair in the hallway, stood up and smiled. Come on into the kitchen, he said. I'll make us a midnight snack. And you'll want something to drink. Hot chocolate, perhaps? Coraline walked down the hallway until she reached the mirror at the end. Then there was nothing reflected in it but a young girl in her dressing gown and slippers, who looked like she had recently been crying, but whose eyes were real eyes, not black buttons. And who was holding tightly to a burnt-out candle and a candlestick. She looked at the girl in the mirror and the girl in the mirror looked back at her. I will be brave, she thought Coraline. No, I am brave. She put down the candlestick on the floor, then turned around. The other mother and the other father were looking at her hungrily. I don't need a snack, she said. I have an apple, see? She, was, she, and she took an apple from her dressing gown pocket, then bit into it with relish and enthusiasm that she did not really feel. The other father looked disappointed. The other mother smiled, showing a full set of teeth and each of the teeth was a tiny bit too long. The lights in the hallway made her black button eyes glitter and gleam. You don't frighten me, said Coraline, although they did frighten her very much. I want my parents back. The world seemed to shimmer a little at the edges. Whatever would I have done with your old, with your old parents? If they have left you, Coraline, it must be because they became bored of you or tired. Now I will never become bored with you. I will never abandon you. You will always be safe here with me. The other mother's wet looking black hair drifted around her head like the tentacles of a creature in the deep ocean. They weren't bored of me, said Coraline. You're lying, you stole them. Silly, silly Coraline. They are fine wherever they are. Coraline simply glared at their other mother. I'll prove it, said the other mother and brushed the surface of the mirror with her long white fingers. It clattered over as if a dragon had breathed on it and then it cleared. In the mirror, it was daytime already. Coraline was looking at the hallway all the way down to her front door. The door opened from the outside and Coraline's mother and father walked inside, 
they carried his suitcases. That was a fine holiday, said Coraline's father. How nice it is not to have Coraline anymore, said her mother with a happy smile. Now we can do all the things we've always wanted to do, like go abroad, but we're prevented from doing by having a little daughter. Anne, said her father, I take great comfort in knowing that her other mother will take better care of her than we ever could. The mirror fogged and faded and reflected the light once more. See, said the other mother. No, said Coraline. I don't see, and I don't believe it either. She hoped that would be, she would have just seen what was not real, but she was not as certain as she sounded. There was a tiny doubt inside her, like a maggot in an apple core. Then she looked up and saw the expression of her own, of her other mother's face, a flash of real anger, which crossed her face like summer lightning. And Coraline was sure in her heart that what she had seen in the mirror was no more than an illusion. Coraline sat down on the sofa and ate her apple. Please, said her other mother, don't be difficult. She walked into the drawing room and clapped her hands twice. There was a rustling noise and a black rat appeared. It stared up at her. Bring me the key, she said. The rat chittered, then it ran through the open door and let, led back to Coraline's old flat. The rat returned, dragging the key behind it. Why don't you have your own key on this side? Asked Coraline. There's only one key, only one door, said the other father. Hush, said the other mother. You must not bother our darling Coraline's head with such trivialities. She put the key in the keyhole and twisted. The lock was stiff, but it clunked close. She dropped the key into her apron pocket. Outside, the sky had begun to light into a luminous gray. If we weren't going, aren't going to have a midnight snack, said the other mother, we still need our beauty sleep. I'm going back to bed. Coraline, I would strongly suggest that you do the same. She placed her long white fingers on the shoulders of the other father, and she walked him out of the room. Coraline walked over to the door at the far end of the dry room. She tugged on it, but it was locked, tightly locked. The door of her parents' bedroom was now closed. She was indeed tired, but she did not want to sleep in the bedroom. She did not want to sleep under the same roof as her other mother. The front door was not locked. Coraline walked out into the dawn and down the stone stairs. She sat down on the bottom step. It was cold. Something furry pushed itself against her side in one smooth, insinuating motion. Coraline jumped, then breathed a sigh of relief when she saw what it was. Oh, it's you, she said to the black cat. See, said the cat. It wasn't so hard recognizing me, was it, even without names? Well, what if I wanted to call you? The cat wrinkled its nose and managed to look unimpressed. Calling cats, it confided, tends to be a rather overrated activity. Might as well call it whirlwind. What if it was dinner times, asked Coraline. Wouldn't you want to be called then? Of course, said the cat. But a simple cry of dinner would do nicely, see? No need for names. Why does she want me, Coraline asked the cat. Why does she want me to stay here with her? She wants something to love, I think, said the cat. Something that isn't her. She might want something to eat as well. It's hard to tell with creatures like that. Do you have any advice, asked Coraline. The cat looked as if it were about to say something else sarcastic. Then it flicked its whiskers and said, challenge her. There's no guarantee she'll play fair, but her kind of thing loves games and challenges. What kind of thing is that, asked Coraline. But the cat made no answer. Simply stretched luxurious luxuriantly and walked away. Then it stopped and turned and said, I'd go inside if I were you, get some sleep. You have a long day ahead of you. And then the cat was gone. Still, Coraline realized it had a point. She crept back into the silent house, past the closed bedroom door, inside which the other mother and other father, what, she wondered, slept, waited. Then it, began, it came to her that she sh should she open the bedroom door, she would, would find it empty, or more precisely that it was an empty room it would remain empty until the exact moment that she opened the door. Somehow that made it easier. Coraline walked into the green and pink parody of her own bedroom. She closed the door and hauled the toy box in front of it. It would not keep anyone out, but the noise somebody would, ma would make trying to dislodge it would wake her, she hoped. The toys in the toy box were most, still mostly asleep, and they stirred and muttered as she moved their box. Then they went back to sleep. Coraline checked under the bed, looking for rats, but there was nothing there. She took off her dressing gown and slippers and climbed into bed and fell asleep with barely enough time to reflect as she did so on what the cat could have met by a challenge. So that is the end of our chapter. So Coraline has realized her parents are missing, learned they are trapped somewhere and um, believes the other mother has trapped them. So she has returned to um, try to get them back. So we will continue reading. Um, on Monday of next week, um, chapter six. For those of you who are taking notes along with me, 
I will bring them up now. Assuming they're going to show up for you guys today. Fortunately, we're having some internet issues, so I will get them back up for you guys. There we go. Chapter five. So, uh, name on your paper. Today's date um, is ten twenty three or twenty. If you're reading along with us today, if not, please put the correct date on your paper. We read Coraline, um, chapter five. The first thing we learned was that Caroline's parents have not yet come back home. Um, and she began to wonder uh, where they've been. It's been now two nights that she's gone to sleep and they have not been there. Um, the cat shows Coraline that they need help. So the cat comes and wakes her up and takes her to the mirror. Remember they write, help us on the fog mirror. Um, she does call the police and they kind of mock her. And um, so she decides it's up to her to get them back. So Coraline goes to the other mother to get her parents back because she's pretty confident that the other mother's done something with them and somehow has trapped them and she will need to get them back from them. And so she's now there at the other house and it's been locked by the other mother and she now has a key. And Coraline now has gone to sleep to try to get some rest before trying to figure out how to get her parents back in the next day. So thank you for joining us. Uh, look forward to reading chapter six with you guys later. And I um, hope you um, have enjoyed this. <laughs>